Hello, everyone. So first, I'll please ask questions on the app. And first, a disclaimer. Uh, I don't have anything to do with Stack Overflow. I'm not an employee. I'm not in no way connected to Stack Overflow. I am, in fact, an employee of the University of Cambridge, where I work in bioinformatics. And yeah, Cambridge is very nice. This is a photo. and. Uh, Cambridge is so beautiful, but I actually work here, so... <laughs> <laughs> and my data is usually about genomes, and about human genomes, about mouse genomes, and I work in cancer research. But I'm not a biologist, so sometimes the data are a bit too like complex and too biological for me, because this is, for example, of data that I actually work with. It's a lot about genomes. And the human genome has three billions of base pairs, and I actually work on the level of individual base pairs sometimes. So it's a lot of information that it's very hard to understand. So I like to play with other data. So, for example, I extracted a social network of Star Wars. <laughs> but today I'll be talking about Stack Overflow. And why Stack Overflow? Well, because we all do this, right? Stack Overflow is the place where you go to if you have a question and want it answered about programming. So, what kind of data are there actually about Stack Overflow? Well, you can use their API, but that's more sort of for integrating Stack Overflow into your own applications. But luckily for me, as a data scientist and machine learning person, Stack Overflow actually publishes every three months a dump of the entire data that are on Stack Overflow. So you can just go and download it. So that's amazing. And that basically just encourages people to play with the data themselves and explore what's out there. So I actually downloaded this data. Uh, this is just in a command line when I was looking at how large the data are. And overall, it's about 135 gigabytes of data. Is that big data? Well, it doesn't fit into memory on my laptop, but it does fit into memory on my desktop at work. So I wouldn't say it's really big data. It's big data enough so that uh, you don't do most of the analysis on a laptop. But also, another point is that uh, if you have large enough RAM, a lot of problems that you might have with big data just disappear. You don't have to use uh, any like, cloud-based solutions. You don't have to use Spark or in F Sharp, I would use Embrace, etc. You can just load everything into the memory, and that's it. So I wouldn't say this is big data. But uh, what can we do with it? And at work, sometimes like, a colleague comes, and they give me like, a, you know, two uh, hard drives four terabytes, saying, OK, here is data. Tell me something about it. And I'm like, what <laughs> should I do with it? <laughs> and they're like, well, the data will tell us, right? <laughs> the point is, the data won't tell you. You need to start with questions. So and it's true for genomic data. It's true for Stack Overflow as well. So the first question that I thought of asking was, so this is how a standard post on Stack Overflow looks. This is actually the first ever post on Stack Overflow. And it was eight years ago. And one of the great things is that each post on Stack Overflow, or each question, has tags here. So it's immediately annotated with what the people are interested in. So I can look at tags. And I can look at, for example, so which tags are like, most common on Stack Overflow. What are people asking questions about? Well, that's an interesting question, but not from really like a data science point of view, because Stack Overflow already tells me that. So the most frequent ones are JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, and PHP. So let's move on. Uh, so this is not an interesting question for me as a researcher. So another interesting question I might be asking is, each post is tagged with the tag, and also with the time when the people ask the question. 
So I can, for example, think, OK, so if I'm asking a question about R, when should I ask it on Stack Overflow so that most people see it, etc. So I decided to look at when are people asking questions. So the first question is when. And I have pre-processed some of the data. I have them here in a CSV file. This is a go-to format. And I want to show you something very cool in F Sharp called type providers. So this is just a very big CSV file with some pre-processed data where I have information about each post and when it was asked or answered, etc. And it's over one gigabyte in size. So it would fit into memory on my laptop, but it would take some time to load everything, etc. So I want to show you how F Sharp makes exactly this task much easier. I will use type providers, as I said, so I will just create a type, because F Sharp is a statically typed language. Uh, and I will create a type that will be called, for example, tag time. And I will use something called CSV provider. And I will just give it the file as a parameter. So now what it does uh, under the scenes or behind the scenes is that it goes into the file, looks at the beginning, and infers all types and the structure of the file. So now if I create a variable called pt, for example, and do type time dot uh, uh, get sample, this will actually load the file. And I can look at uh, uh, dot, uh, rows. And now this gives me a sequence of rows in the CSV file. And I can do seek.map, because F -sharp is a functional language. And now I can do row dot and uh, uh, yeah, now it loaded the file, and it tells me that in the file there are three elements in each row. The first one is the day of the week, it's a string. The second one is the tag, which is a string as well, and the third time is time, which is of type system.datetime, which is a .NET type used to represent time. And you can see, for example, I'll just give it the day of the week. Uh, I haven't even looked at the file, and it's uh, not loaded in memory. So what it does is actually just looks at the beginning and infers the entire structure. And I can write my code knowing that this will be correct by the time it runs, actually, on the file, which is a great help in exploring large data sets. Mm -hmm. so. So I asked the question, when do people ask or answer questions on Stack Overflow? And I plotted it for F Sharp, because I was doing it in F Sharp. So you can see that people ask and answer most questions from Monday to Friday, and then it drops on Saturday and Sunday. And then I looked at another language on the .NET platform, C Sharp, and it has a very similar pattern. But something uh, caught my attention. And that is that if you look at the ratio between the weekend and the weekday, it's slightly different for C Sharp and F Sharp. Do you see that? So more people ask questions about F Sharp on weekends than on C Sharp. So what's that? Well, it's about side projects and weekend projects and things like that. So this is my friend Chris, who actually does tooling for VS Code that I was using for the demo for F Sharp. And he's working on it on a trip somewhere in the countryside. So the thing is, people ask questions on weekends about things that they like to play with or they like to explore in their free time. So that basically tells us like, a measure of how people love a language. Or if the language is not really used in production, how much people like to play with it in their free time. And that's an awesome measure, right? So. Um, my hypothesis is that normally uh, people ask questions about what they work with. Then people have some evening projects, and these might be even distributed across weekdays and weekends. And then there is this uh, group of questions and answers that get posted on weekends. 
and it might be larger if it's something that you don't use at work and you just have to use it on weekends and then you just can't wait and play with it. Or it can be very small if it's just like a group of people who are sitting at work on the weekend and are miserable asking questions on Stack Overflow because something went horribly wrong. But this difference, this ratio, will tell us how people actually like it or not. So if it's smaller than one, uh, it will be that people use it much less over weekends. And if it's larger than one, that means people use it more on weekends than during weekdays. So this is the weekend index of language. I promise I'll put it somewhere on the web so that you can play with it yourself. And the most weekend things ever are Minecraft, which kind of makes sense, right? It's the thing you play with over the weekend. Uh, then LWJGL, I had to look it up. It's lightweight Java game library. Then SFML, I couldn't remember this, so I wrote it down. It's a simple and fast multimedia library that people actually use for writing games to interact with hardware on your computer. And then the D language and Pygame. So it seems that over weekends, people mainly uh, try to write games in their free time. So what are the most enterprisey things you wouldn't do on a weekend? Well, turns out it's SQL Server reporting <laughs> services. <laughs> so these are the things you wouldn't play with. <laughs> I won't comment on it further. <laughs> And then I was looking at some various functional languages. So for example, this is F sharp, and it has a coefficient of 0.6, which is quite a lot compared to other languages. Uh, people like to play a lot with Haskell in their free time, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and everyone's uh, hobby project right now is writing things with Elm. So again, this has uh, coefficient above one, that means people ask more questions over the weekend than during weekdays. So this is kind of nice. How does it look for data science-y thing? Well, uh, F-sharp is actually the most free time, most loved language out of these. Uh, and the second one is Python. And R is not very like, popular over weekends. And the most enterprisey one is SAS. Also kind of makes sense, right? And then I looked at some other things, and one thing that actually again caught my attention was continuous delivery services, you know, continuous integration. And people quite often ask questions, so should I use Jenkins on Travis? This is actually a question on Stack Overflow, precisely on that, which was closed because it's opinion-based. Uh, and these had one of the biggest like, differences between weekend and weekday usage. So uh, this is actually the difference. So Travis is used for open source projects and for like, uh, fun projects, etc., much more than Jenkins. And I think the main difference is that Travis is actually hosted by Travis and it's free for open source projects. So people tend to use it because it has minimal setup. You can just like, run it from GitHub, etc. With Jenkins, you have to host it yourself, and it's just so much more work. So people play with Travis in their free time, but they don't do that with Jenkins in general. So if you are choosing like, which way to go, like think who is your user, and if you want people to play with your products in their free time, or if you are targeting just the enterprise. So this was my first question. So now what? What else can we do with the data? Uh, another interesting information that's there is location, where people are based, actually. And I thought, well, who would fill in location? Like, no one wants to get tracked, etc. cetera. Uh, but I decided to, let's just like, look at what people put there. Well, actually, there are five mi over five million of users in my data set, and almost a million of them uh, filled in their location, which is quite a lot. So it's definitely more than 1%. Uh, so some of them look like this. That's not very helpful. Uh, some other people actually put in their full address. I'm not sure they realize that it's a public information. Some people put in their address down to their office number. 
Some people put in their address uh, as just a country, etc. Actually, 83% of people put in at least a country that matched one of the countries of the world, which is a lot. <laughs> And some people put in their full address, maybe because they hope that people will like, knock on their door and thank them. Some people probably don't think that people will come to thank them. Well, some locations look like this, some locations look like this. I had to look this place up, and it's actually here. <laughs> <laughs> so people ask questions on Stack Overflow from everywhere. So. I decided to, uh, well, what I did first was that I matched all the locations to countries in the world, and then I took the rest of the locations that couldn't be localized in this way, and decided, well, let's just explore if I can like, find them in some other way. So I looked at a lot of different location services, and I decided to go with Bing search, because they had the largest amount of free requests that I could make and I had to make about 120,000. So, <laughs> and again, did I mention type providers? <laughs> well, what else can I use for exploring data like this? This is, a J, uh, this is a REST API, which returns a JSON. And there is a type provider for that as well. So I can just create a type called, say, Bing search and do JSON provider, because it returns a JSON, and give it an example request. And this is really just the URL with the example request, that's all. And now I can do, mm -mm. Uh, uh, let's, let's look up where Copenhagen is. So location will be Copenhagen. And now I need the query for the REST API. So I will just copy this and change my example Prague. I'm from Prague. You should go there. It's an awesome city. To my query location. Mm -mm. So now I can do just let's result equal Bing search, uh, load query. And again, I haven't run anything at all right now. This is all there is. There is no, nothing happening uh, anywhere, no library that I would use for this, except F -sharp data, which contains the JSON provider. And now I can do result dot, mm -mm, and this is all the content of the JSON file that I receive as a response. Ah. <laughs> I'm not touching anything. So, result, and I think the actual location is hidden within the JSON document. So I will just do seek.map, and this is some resource, and I will go to resource resources again, and now another map inside, and r dot. And now this is again the content of the JSON file. So I can just go to address dot country region. And this should tell me the country where Copenhagen is located. So again, I will just need to run it now. Mm -hmm. And here in F Sharp Interactive is the result. So it's probably in Denmark, but there is some Copenhagen in the US as well. So this is all it took me to basically create a wrapper around the Bing search for location, which is pretty cool. I think it's basically what I did was it took me like four lines of actual code. So I ran that on all. Uh, the, the locations that I couldn't localize directly. And it gives me things like that. Like for JavaScript, I can just plot the result, and it tells me that most JavaScript uh, programmers are in the US, etc. So it doesn't actually tell me that much, because I know that in the US there are a lot of people, and then in India there are a lot of people there as well. So 
I decided to ask a different question. So where is it most likely that I will find a programmer using my favorite technology, like F Sharp? So this is my very scientific equation. And I realized that I know how many users on Stack Overflow can be located, how many people are registered. And if I can get a population of a country, then I can see like, what's the probability of meeting a person. And uh, the unit I will get out of this is programmers per million. <laughs> this is actually an almost valid unit, because in bioinformatics, I work with a unit called uh, parts per million. So this is also PPM. But programmers per million. So how many f -sharp programmers per million of inhabitants are in each country, et cetera? So, so where really are people? This is my next question. Uh, and uh, I will again use f -sharp. And did I mention type providers? <laughs> so there is another type provider called the HTML type provider. And what I gave it here is just the URL of a Wikipedia page containing list of countries and dependencies uh, by population. And don't go on Wikipedia and try to change it right now, because I have a stable uh, URL. So what I now can do is type let p equals population uh, get sample. And again, in the same way I could do it before, I do just p dot. Now I have the option of looking at lists, tables, or the HTML in the document. So I will look at tables. And now I have a table called countries and dependencies by population. And I can look at the, uh, This very much depends on the internet connection at the moment. So, and I can look at the rows, and I can do again C map fun row. F sharp is language where fun is a keyword. Fun is not optional. <laughs> <laughs> and now in every row, I have elements like percent of world population, country population, etc. So I can, for example, print like a country name. And again, it should tell me that this is a string if I just bind it into some variable. So now countries are a sequence of strings. So this is really cool because I don't have to write parsers for HTML. I don't have to do anything. I don't even have to look at the, the web page. I don't have to look up where the table is that I'm trying to parse because it will tell me. So again, I won't even run this. You can see that it gives me all this information without actually running the code. So I can just write it and then compile it, and it will just work. So uh, uh, let's go back to my slides. So where are the most programmers per million for each language? So for F Sharp, actually, it's interesting. Denmark is the right place to be, because in Denmark, there are almost 82 F sharp programmers per million of people. That's amazing. <laughs> and Scandinavia seems to be very high on F sharp programmers as well, in general. And then there are in China, 20 per million. Uh, what about R? If you are doing data science, turns out Iceland is the place to be. There are like 185 programmers per million. And China, surprisingly. So uh, if you want to meet our programmers, go to these countries. And well, there was one outlier that always jumped up. I was playing with different languages, looking at the, the concentration everywhere. And turns out the Dominican Republic is where most programmers are concentrated in an above average rate. I think it's digital nomads, probably. Or maybe there is just a group of people who like, post on Stack Overflow all the time from Dominican Republic. But uh, if you want to find any programmers, go to Dominican Republic. <laughs> well, one disclaimer, there is a huge sampling bias. And this is what kills you if you are trying to do, like, for example, election predictions. 
So, you, uh, for example, Brexit predictions were like 52 for stay, 48 for leave, etc., right before the vote. But it ended up the other way around. And the thing is, it's very hard to sample from a population in a way that preserves uh, the right uh, ratio of different people in the population. So this is basically, uh, I have a lot of sample, uh, sampling biases in this data. First one of them is uh, I'm looking at just people on Stack Overflow. I'm just looking at people who put their location on Stack Overflow, which might be very country dependent. And I'm also looking at just people who could be located with this. So this is, uh, so now we know when to post, what people like, where do people live. So let's look at something a bit more machine learning -y. So I looked at tags and I looked at users and when they post. And this actually gives me sort of like a communities in the Stack Overflow space. So if I look at the tags, if I post with tags uh, like C sharp and F sharp and R, etc., it tells something about me. It tells something about the technologies that I use. And I can then find people who post about similar things. So tags define relations. And I can look at tags that are similar in terms of people who post with them or who use them. So as an example, me and my friend Chris, uh, we both use F sharp. I don't use C sharp, he does. Uh, everyone uses JavaScript. I use R, he doesn't, and none of us uses COBOL. And this gives me a matrix. And each row in this matrix defines a user behavior, and each column in this matrix defines uh, basically how tags are similar in terms of people that use them. And when I have a matrix, I'm a hyper data scientist, because once my data are in numeric form, I can do anything with them. So I decided to look at the whole data set, but it was a bit too big to like, process properly. Uh, because it's 44,000 tags and over 5 million users. So I just looked at people who uh, post on Stack Overflow a lot and tags that are very common so that I have some bit more denser data. So I looked at the users with more than 1,000 posts. There is a lot of them. And the tags that have more than 5,000 either answers or questions or comments, etc. And this gave me 1,600 users and 800 tags. So this is already something I can work with even on a laptop. And the first thing, uh, first rule, if you are doing anything with data that you can just, can't just look at, is to create some form of visualization, because it always tells you something about the data. So I decided to use my go-to tool right now for high-dimensional data, which is called TSNI. The distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. Who has heard about this method? A couple of people. <laughs> it sounds very, very complicated, but the main idea is, I'll try to explain with my rough sketches, imagine data in a very high-dimensional hyperspace that are concentrated on a manifold there. So this is like a paper in 2D space, but the paper is one-dimensional. And if I look at these two points located in different sections of the paper, uh, they are very close in the 2D space, but in logic of the data, they are very far from each other. So what this method of visualization does, it basically just looks at the local neighborhood of each point and tries to project that into 2D, so that things that are close to each other in the very high dimensional space will stay close to each other in the low dimensional projection as well. And the things that are further away from each other, they can be like either close or far from each other because the uh, projection into low dimensional space for uh, visualization, it's very, very, it reduces a lot of information. But at least this one gives me the sort of guarantee that things that are very close to each other in the high dimensional space will be close to each other in my projection as well. So this is how you would do it in R. It's very similar in Python. You can just load a library called TSNI and just call it on a matrix and give it some parameters, etc., and then plot it. Well, did I mention type providers? <laughs> uh, 
there is something called R provider, which gives me the same experience that I had with my data with R. It gives me access to all functions that are in R, uh, but from F sharp, and I can just call them by doing R dot. I'm not showing it here because it takes a bit of time. R is not the fastest language usually. Uh, but this is how it looks in F sharp. It's very similar to how it looks in R. You can just see that I had to call it slightly differently with parameters, but it's just R dot tsne. So I ran this. Remember, this is running the R library underneath. It's actually using a quite a complex mathematical model that I didn't want to re-implement. So this is what you get. <laughs> nice, right? <laughs> well, the best thing about R is that it was written by statisticians. And the worst thing about R is that it was written by statisticians. So this is the point where you basically want to have a proper language that you can play with and that you can do like, actual stuff with. R is good for some things. For example, if you don't want to implement some complicated mathematical model or method, you can just call it. But then it's good to have the data in a normal language that you can use and create, for example, some visualization. So I decided to stay in F-sharp and use a project called Fable, which is a compiler from F-sharp to JavaScript. And this is what I came up with, because once you are in something like JavaScript, you can, for example, optimize placement of labels around points so that they don't overlap and things like that. So let's just look at, zoom into this large graph. So this is one very tightly knit cluster of people doing Android programming. Uh, there is one for JavaScript, and Node.js, etc. Uh, what surprised me is that people doing JavaScript often ask about Google Maps API for some reason, or at least my visualization tells me that. There is another cluster of people being confused about uh, object-oriented programming, etc. And I have another version of the visualization running here. And because it's in JavaScript, I can like hover over a node, and it tells me like this is jar, etc. And I can also search for nodes. So let's search for F sharp. F sharp is right here. What's around F sharp? For example, this is mono. And that's cool because I'm running everything on mono. So let's look at, I don't know, R. And R should be somewhere. Uh, uh, I have to zoom out. Mm -hmm. R is here. And what's around R? Uh, uh, I'm not sure you can see that. So what is around R? It's data frame, that makes sense, ggplot, matrix. So that's cool, because just based on looking at how people interact with different technologies on Stack Overflow, it realized that R has something to do with data frames and matrices, etc. So that's very nice. And again, on the technical side of things, because I wrote everything in F sharp, I'm actually running it in JavaScript, but I can look at sources here. And because Fable, the F Sharp compiler, produces source maps, I can actually even debug my code here in JavaScript. I can like set breakpoints and then run it. And uh, it didn't stop on the breakpoint. Oh no. Oh, yeah, thank you. Mm. I will put it somewhere else. Mm. It shouldn't create this request. All right, it usually works. But the point is, I can actually debug or look at my F sharp code and how it corresponds to this uh, JavaScript code. So, R is cool, but sometimes you just want to move into something else. So, and again, this might look a bit like toyish example, like why do I visualize uh, how tags or, mm, relate to each other in Stack Overflow? But this is an example from genomics where they looked at human uh, genomic variation. 
And you can use exactly the same algorithm to visualize that, even though it's a uh, much more higher dimensional data set than Stack Overflow. And uh, it's from an academic paper, so it's not so nice as my JavaScript visualization, right? Uh, but for example, this is like a Chinese population, this is a Japanese population, this is African population, with the blue dots are uh, from the US. And it tells you quite a lot of things. For example, the Japanese population is very homogeneous genomically, genetically, and African population is much more heterogeneous. It's actually the most heterogeneous population uh, out of all human uh, like locations. Uh, so, and because I played with it using my Stack Overflow data, I know how it will behave on a much more complex data that I can't really understand by just looking at it. And I think this is very cool and very useful. So I looked at tags, I looked at users, I looked at technologies. What else can I do? I can look at the actual questions and answers, right? That, that's the core of Stack Overflow. Uh, and because we are in the deep learning track, I decided to use words to vec which is a very cool, not a deep learning task, but it's shallow learning network that that's something quite similar to the TSNI visualization method that I was showing you before. It creates something called word embeddings. And the TSNI looked at points and looked at their neighborhood and tried to project them into a lower dimensional space. And word to vec does something quite similar because it looks at words in sentences and their local context and their local neighborhood and creates an embedding into a vector space. I don't want to go into too many details, but you can just like, uh, run it quite straightforwardly. Just give it a lot of text, and it will create word embeddings into a vector space. And the very cool thing about words to vec is that, well, first, how it works, like rough idea, is, for example, if you have two sentences, like F -sharp is a functional language on the .NET platform, and Scala is a functional language on the JVM. It, tells you that they are related and they are all surrounded by functional, but they are on different platforms. So this defines like a sort of local neighborhood around each word. And you can encode this, put it into a shallow neural network, and then after you get vectors out of this, you can do arithmetics with vectors, which is very cool. You can do Scala minus JVM plus .NET, and you get C sharp and F sharp. So this is pretty impressive, and it just looked at how people use these words in Stack Overflow in their questions and answers. And for example, if you look at F# -sharp minus .NET, well, you get SML and OCaml, which are ML languages, which are all our ML family of languages. And then you had Haskell and Idris. So these are all functional programming languages. So this is, I think, very cool. It again tells you something about these words that. Uh, you can, for example, just transform F# -sharp from the .NET environment into some other context, and this tells you that. And again, this is a lot of fun. Like you can play with things, you can add and subtract technologies, and see what comes out of that. But this is actually quite an important task, even in academic research, because I work in bioinformatics, and there is a lot of uh, literature on like genes and pathways, etc. And it's beyond like, the attention span of a single human to actually absorb all this. So there is a lot of research going on on data mining in paper databases, looking for genes, etc., and to summarize the information in some nice form. Uh, and people were, were actually trying to use words to vec for this type of thing as well. Because wouldn't it be great to just look at a gene and transform it from one environment, like, I don't know, breast cancer, and transform it, so how, what does it do in uh, pancreatic cancer, etc. And, well, we are not there yet, but we are getting closer. And this is just one tool in the toolbox. So, in the end, uh, I decided to ask one crucial question. So these were all like very toy nice examples, but like what actually about Stack Overflow that's important? Well, is Stack Overflow a meritocracy? That means if you see a question and decide to answer it, will the score you get for that question depend on your reputation? 
if you are famous or not? Does it depend on that? Or do people evaluate quality of answers just based on their usefulness? Well, first I looked at how score actually relates to author reputation. Well, this is like standard plot. You can't really see anything from this. Uh, this is on a log scale. And this tells you that, for example, if your reputation is around 100, then you will probably never get more than 10 for e your answer. Uh, if your reputation is 1,000, you probably won't get more than 100 uh, points for your answer. So this, is, this seems to be quite a strong rule in the Stack Overflow dataset. But uh, I decided to try some proper machine learning and do some regression modeling using like, various input data, like if a question was accepted, what was the score of the question, how many tags the question had, how many answers there were, how many comments there were under the question, uh, how many people favorited the question, etc., and try to predict the score of an answer based on that. And I tried a lot of different models, like linear, nonlinear regressions, random forest, SVMs, neural networks, etc. And turns out the most predictive things about uh, your score are how many people liked the question, how many people looked at the question, and if your answer was accepted or not. So this seems nice, right? This seems it really depends just on your answer. Uh, well, not so much. Well, I, well, depends on the person. Then I was looking at some diagnostic plots in R, and it's not that important like how this plot is created. But on the uh, y-axis, it's the residuals. That means like the error in your prediction. And on the x-axis is something called leverage. And leverage is this thing. Basically, uh, the higher your leverage, the more strength you have in the predictions or in the model. And it seems that here, like this group of points, has very high leverage compared to the rest. So that's kind of weird, right? So I decided to investigate. Yeah, this is another illustration of the leverage. The point in the upper right corner has the highest leverage out of all the points because it can shift the regression into any direction. And it turns out this person has the highest leverage. And if you have done anything with C Sharp, you know that this person, John Skeet, uh, answers everything. And he has the highest reputation on Stack Overflow everywhere. He's like the, uh, like the hero of C Sharp people on Stack Overflow. And so uh, the thing is, also, my predictions were not very good, actually. They could explain only about 40% of the score you get for your answer. So I guess the quality really matters in the post on Stack Overflow, which is a good thing. Well, unless you are John Skeet, because then everyone upvotes you just, by, just because you answered. So Stack Overflow, uh, your quality of your answers is only about uh, well, the score of your answers is only about the quality of answer you give, which is great. So, just to wrap up, so I hopefully I showed you that type providers are a very cool tool for exploring data, and also data science is just about selecting the right tool for the part of the job you are doing. So in data science, you can't really use just one language for everything. You have to mix and match. Uh, you can just uh, well, I showed you that you can use quite a lot of things just from F Sharp directly, but play with things and use anything that works for your data. And on the data science side of things, well, I think I went through quite a lot of things, but the main thing is try to ask questions. And I hope I showed you, at least in the first part, that you don't need a PhD in mathematics or machine learning to actually play with the data and infer some very cool things about it and maybe move to Dominican Republic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there are some questions. Um, and trade. Uh, how come uh, you use Mono instead of uh, Visual Studio? That's one question. Uh, how come I use... Uh, uh, mo mono. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I use Mono because I'm working on a Mac, and at work I'm working on a Linux, so why would I use Visual Studio? Uh, Visual Studio runs only on Windows, and there is very good tooling for F Sharp on Mono, and well, I'm sure it will be... Well, you saw that in my TSNI visualization, F Sharp was right next to Mono. So you could see that the tooling was very good, and it was working fine on a Mac. Okay, has one uh, relating to the weekend index, I think. Could it be that the reason for many questions on a specific language is just that it is uh, more difficult? So, uh, for instance, that uh, F Sharp is more difficult than Python? Well, I think that people ask questions all the time, and it may not be only about difficulty. Well, it might be about difficulty, but then I would suppose that uh, the ratio would be roughly similar over week weekdays and weekends. And if people ask questions more in general, I think that would uh, require some very heavy normalization because I would have to normalize it by the number of users who actually ask questions, etc. But I am just expecting that the rate, uh, ratio of people asking questions is uh, like, it might depend on the difficulty of the question or difficulty of the language, but it will be roughly similar over weekdays and weekends. This might be rough, uh, very simplifying, but it tells me at least how people interact with the language in their free time or in their weekday work. And one more here. Uh, what uh, are you currently working on? What Some am I currently things? working on? Well, depends. <laughs> Uh, at work, I actually work on exploring patterns of variations in pancreatic cancer. Outside of work, I'm playing with cool data, and you should too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here, so if you want to see some more type providers in action, or some more F Sharp or R or anything, come and find me. Yes. Thank you. Remember to vote, and let's uh, thank Evelina. Thank you.